Lieutenant? Looks laughing at me. Okay. That was me. I was laughing at you. Okay. Well, I guess I'll just I'll just cl here. There's no countdown. You guys are talking when it's unmuted. Cool. Here you go, Sam. Just 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 get into it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a Valanova talk show episode. 13, or I should say we are covering episode 13, um, dark session that we, uh, had, um, but let's just jump right into it, um, I'll do, I'll do what Clay always does, anything to say off rip, or should we just jump straight into the question? This after show talk show, talk show brought to you by baddragon.com. See, if we say it enough, one day it will become true, mm -hmm. and I can't wait for that moment. So cursed. <laughs> All right. Um, off the back of that, let's get started. Um, question number one: We started off the session on a bit of a darker note with the torture of the creator. How did everyone's characters feel about that moment, and has anyone's opinions of each other's changed because of the actions committed? Um, we'll go bottom to top. We'll start off with Raider. Um. <clears throat> I feel like Draven. Draven's definitely not the type of guy, even during his time with the Shadow Snakes, that was on board with torture. Um, that being said, he is one that is very familiar with the ways of torture. Um, so I feel like even though he felt bad about being involved in that situation again, it's not something he's necessarily like not used to. He's he's seen his share of torture. Um. <clears throat> What really kind of like tugs at his heartstrings is the fact that uh, Petra mostly is the one that had to do a good chunk of it, um, and seeing seeing her that that much in such a state of distraught is uh, really. I don't know if I want to use the word worrying to him or if I want to just say that it's it's just it breaks his heart to see it. I guess would I I would say that, but. Um, in terms of opinions, I wouldn't say his opinions changed on anyone. Um, he is kind of proud of Hazel for kind of like stepping up and taking like the first like questioning session. Um, and with Petra, I, I feel like those two in particular, and especially with Petra, his opinion hasn't changed, but he's he's definitely seeing where she's coming from. She, he knows why she did what she did. And he gets it. That being said, again, it kind of breaks his heart to see her in that state, but yeah, no. Yeah, no. But yeah, I don't agree. I think with um, Petra, it's not so much a matter of um, opinions changing of her. It's just she's changed because of the circumstance, which is rough to see. But yes, I'm uh, moving on. Uh, uh, why? Moon, think about all this man um i know i didn't really say much during the torture scene because i was like i mean i felt like it was other people's scene more so and i'm like i have nothing to contribute to this so i'm not going to say anything um but i mean yeah i mean truly it's just a tough situation and a moral dilemma obviously he'd never been faced with before of like mm, do we let him live but he like murders people chops them up turns them into horrible amalgamations that have like one stream of consciousness um where all they can think about is their own death on loop in a sense um do we let that guy like live because like it's bad to kill a person you know killing bad right um because like obviously he wants him to die he thinks him dying is probably the best thing but you don't want to say oh we should kill him so it's better just to let other people talk and come to that like conclusion though he was like kind of not alarmed but i guess like like giovanni and like draven he thought would be more vocally against killing and torturing Ugh. but like there was like little to no um back talk on it i think moon was one of the only people who really was like no and he only said something once and then uh, like 
it was quickly like glazed over. I think Draven was pretty like, well, uh, I'm gonna get to work. Whatever you need me to do, boss. To be fair, I, Draven's like against like his um, his resistance against that was kind of like thrown out the window during the first Flesh Golem because that's where we, he was like, we should wait and you know figure out everything before we actually act. But once we figured out that you know there was such a level of suffering. He was just like, nah, we gotta take care of this now. And I feel like that definitely bled over into the torture. Mm. Still. Moon was like, no, I, I I get you. People people are really okay with this. Alright. Um And I guess. And also, like with the Petra specifically, obviously, like taking the most aggressive role in torture. Um I mean, Moon, like, I mean, Moon gets it. He's like... <sighs> he. It's no secret that Petra had killed someone before. She had literally confessed to killing someone because they hurt her child. And this is another man who has hurt her child. I mean, not even hurt, like, killed, in a sense. Uh, or by extension, because it was probably Gothbrook who, like, killed him, and then, like, his dead body was given to the creator based off information we have. But... Regardless, like, um, he did something worse than death to Vikros. Um, so Moon's like, yeah, who am I to tell Petra no? Right? Like, Moon's like, I'm not a mom. I can't, like, begin to, like, empathize with this. He's like, yeah, I, like, care a lot about, like, my little sister, um, but I'm also not delusioned into thinking, like, I'm her parent. Maybe in, like, a fun way. But on a very serious note, ultimately, like, I never had that kind of responsibility. And having a kid is different. So, you know, he didn't want Petra to have to do those things. But then looking at the group, he's like, who do you decide does it? You know? Do you make the 17-year-old do it? because she's a trained soldier? Do you make Draven, like, do it? Like, even though Draven's, like, I even had dialogue of saying, you know, he's tortured before or whatever, it's like, you know that Draven doesn't want to do that kind of thing. You know, like, I imagine, like, Moon looking at people's faces, you know, and just being able to think, like, you're such a nice person, like, you don't want to put that on him. Giovanni is like out of his fucking depth here. Fucking, he's a fisherman. Just joined our group very, very recently. Um, and again, Giovanni, another jovial person. And then you have Petra, who's just willing to do it. Who like is like, let me do it. I want to do this. You, you know, Moon doesn't want her to have to do it, but then he's like, I'm not fucking doing it. I think um I think I said before like with the werewolf uh Omara that if Draven couldn't find uh a cure that Moon was actually going to kill Omara himself while she was in werewolf form rather than let Hazel do it um because he didn't want Hazel to have to have that on her conscience like he's like I'm already a bad person I can do this thing, right? Like, I don't want Hazel to have to do that. But this was, like, a different level. Because he's, like, you know, killing, like, an, a werewolf that's, you know, totally out of control. Like, this is, like, a sentient, like, person. And he's, like, fucked up. But it just wasn't on the same level as, like, I guess, like, putting down a rabid dog versus, you know, I mean, actually killing a person was the way Moon framed in his mind. So he's, like, I... I'm too much of a coward to like step up and like stop Petra from doing this and he felt like Petra would be pissed if he like jumped in and took it from her so he just like left it and he doesn't feel good about it um yeah a lot of internalized stuff you know Hopefully we'll get to we'll play next session more the lasting effects of having killed a person. We'll see. 
Um, we'll jump to Giovanni because I feel like Nick will be the nice little cherry on top of this discussion. <laughs> you're so waiting you're... so that you could be like, okay, the person who's on top, go ahead, because you want to make sure that Nick, because he said, you know, bottom to top, so you're trying to like do it in order, right? Yeah, well, Nick's always the top, so I can't have him. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> Real quick, uh, Nick, can you make that face again? Which one? The the one you made that yeah, there we go. Alright, you're good. <laughs> the brightest the brightest neon flash screenshot in demand. Yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> so next up um, Giovanni. Yeah, so uh Giovanni was like he he felt like the, the party was kind of backed into a corner in the situation because like the we've recently learned that the government fundamentally is corrupt and like infiltrated by the enemies that are we're fighting like uh, they he literally has allies in the emerald knights so giovanni like he was like, well, our options here, we don't really have it because, <laughs> um, one, we have this man captured, we turn him into the Emerald Order. Okay, well, it's corrupt. They're just gonna, they're gonna break him out. Uh, what is another option? Oh, I guess we, maybe we could... Uh, turn them into the Shadow Snakes. Well, the Shadow Snakes is a crime family that would probably not use it for, you know, use this guy for good intention. Um, uh, you know, he feels like this secret sect of the Emerald Order isn't going to help us out. Um, so, like, our options are to like kill this man or capture him and and keep him like locked in our basement so uh in the gravity of the stuff that this man has done like from fighting these flesh golems to when he popped up from that uh grate that we uh, use the acid on and he saw just all these mangled corpses and stuff like all the all those were like living people you know they, they most of them probably hadn't done much wrong they maybe were down on their luck and were like out on the streets and got killed and you know disemboweled he's like this is an unredeemable person like anybody that would be able to do this it's like when he like it, him just seeing it made him throw up like anybody that would be able to enact such violence on a human being or even a, a like a, a cadaver um is not redeemable in in his eyes so he thought that the the only option would be to to kill this man and uh with in terms of the torture like he was like petra had a, a family member killed by this man like he can't even imagine what he would do to someone that if he found out they they killed his dad like he he doesn't know what he would do. So he, he can't even imagine what's going through Petra's mind. Um, so he didn't want to... Because he felt like him getting in the way of it would only worsen the situation. Like Petra is so on the brink of a breakdown and like is actively breaking down. He doesn't want to like push her further off the edge. So he was like... You know, this is really our only option. We might as well get what we can to help us do 
more good because we're cornered here. There's nothing else we can do with this guy. So that's kind of what was going through his head. Um, he definitely didn't enjoy like watching. That's why he was the first to, to leave and he didn't like stay around it kind of like peak or anything he left because he didn't want to see what was going on at all like he he doesn't enjoy seeing people tortured or anything like that so you know as soon as as soon as it was like okay we have some information like what's gonna happen from now on is gonna be terrible uh i understand that petra has to do that uh, but I don't want to see it, so I'm gonna leave. And I, I, he used his trident to, to like hook him up, so nobody had to stay there and hold him up. Cause he's like, I don't, I don't think you no know, anybody in the group really wants to see this man get brutally tortured. Uh, so that's that's what was going through G Giovanni's head. No, I definitely agree to the extent that I don't think many people in the party would have disagreed on, like, the end goal. Like, he had to die. Not only because, like, he did some truly horrendous things, but, like, we can't, yeah, to your point, we can't send him to the guards, we can't send him to the Emerald Order, we can't even send him to the Shadow Snakes, and we sure as fuck can't, like, look after him. So, truly, the end goal would have been to kill him. But it's the torture that I'm surprised that so many people are not necessarily were okay with, but were like, oh well. Um, it's interesting that everyone in the party was kind of like, yeesh, anyway. Um, but rounding out, uh, speaking of torture, Nick, what was going through your mind at the time? Um... I knew Petra had to do something drastic, and torture was the best uh, option in the moment. Because she couldn't just kill him. Because she killed a woman for hurting one of her kids. So she had to up the ante. Um, so... I don't think a lot was going through her head other than pain and wanting to inflict as much as possible onto him. Um, I had planned to like do worse, but I was just like, it might get a little too gross and dark. So I was just like, let's dial it back. I'm just gonna drown him and then slit his throat a couple of times. It's a uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think there's like conscious like decisions from Petra in those moments. I think it was just acting on impulse uh, and acting uh, on her pain. Um, she didn't like truly care about getting information out of him. She just saw that as a way to you give me what I want and I'll let you go to be able to go back on that and uh, betray his trust um, to hurt him even more. Um, yeah, I, th I think it was kind of more of a head empty moment. Yeah. Um, all right, moving on to the next question. Um, during the session, um, because of the torture, <laughs> We learned some new details regarding the citywide conspiracy. Amongst that new information was the fact that Lagazi, the creator, Meriglods, and Gothbrook were working in tandem to create a form of life. Given all this new information, where do we think the conspiracy is heading? Apparently Nick knew too much. Yeah. He was he got <laughs> froze in the middle of some kung fu fighting. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> ha! 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 Okay, we can Hello. hear. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> um, we will start with uh, GC Man this time. Okay. Uh, so the triad is trying to 
create a body for this person in the book to like inhabit and ascend and that from what it sounds like the earlier members of the triad were partially successful in ascending in the in the godhood um now from what i understand i would assume that the and hazel's gonna get mixed up in this too now because she's got two favors uh <laughs> the it looks like the the child of the of the triad is going to wasn't able to ascend with her mother and is basically store consciousness in this book to wait until she was able to uh get the resources to ascend all in one swoop um in terms of the outside because the population is being kept at the same amount specifically to keep out whatever is outside the city um i i can only imagine some attack on titan stuff <laughs> i have no, i have no idea other than that uh, but that's where my mind is, is going with uh, <laughs> with this. Uh, like ascension to, to uh, godhood and uh, by proxy um, fighting whatever is outside the city. Um, I, yeah, I think it's going to be pretty sick. Um, does anyone else have anything to say? Yeah, I feel like we can all just kind of jump in with our theories and whatnot, and if we want to go next. I just love that, like, we just keep making anime references to, like, what's going on. It's like, is it Fuma <laughs> Alchemist? Is it Attack on Titan? Nah, Garen Lagan? <laughs> I actually, now, now that we've gotten a little bit more information, I'm kind of entertaining the idea that outside the walls is a post-apocalyptic kind of situation um and the whole reason for ascending the godhood is to eventually try and repopulate the world um which that also brings up that the shadow snakes know about this now um otherwise why would they be building a boat mm -hmm. so they're they're trying to escape and get first dibs on the blank slate that is the world essentially at least that's what i'm the idea I'm entertaining right now, that's subject to change, of course, but I, I do think that that's the main focus, that we need a certain amount of bodies to slowly start these experiments, and eventually, once we have that, these certain bodies, maybe even the certain sectors of the city, can all migrate to a certain part of the world and slowly repopulate under these new gods, so to speak. So, I think that might be what's going on right now, but... We'll see what happens. Another thing is that I I do think that even like the higher ups, like in the like for instance in the DeRozans, they they don't know anything about this bigger plot. So mm -hmm. I think everyone else is just pawns in this situation while the other play while the others are just, you know, trying to really get their foothold on their higher position of power. I have so many thoughts about this with all the information we've given because I, I very similar to radar i do think that like post-apocalyptic world out there and like shit completely went south i don't know how or why though but it sounds like that the ascendancy triad and the government are opposed are like are opposing forces right mm -hmm. like because from what the creator said that the magic like the sigil that we believed like around the city was imposed by the crown mm -hmm. and i believe it's like a, the inverse of the wakanda thing like we can't see out into the absolute shit show that's outside mm -hmm. 
And I also think that for some reason the Ascendancy Triad need to get outside to finish their plan. It also my thoughts about the kind of the quad, like the mind, body, flesh and blood and whatnot. They because the creator kept alluding to like the fact like no, it wasn't even the um it wasn't the creator, it was the lady in the book who was kind of like oh, those people have no clue what they're doing, right? They think they're just, like, here to create some sort of life or some sort of army. Um, I don't know how Clay does gods, but I have the feeling that in order to, because this is a very common trope in D&D, in order for a gods to kind of ascend, they need to follow it, right? Like, people need to believe and worship that god. So I think the Ascendancy Triad are trying to manufacture worshippers in order to aid their ascension. That's my leading theory. Uh, my, I have a couple of theories, one of which I have no evidence to support, so I'll start <laughs> with that one. Um, my thought was, is there somebody specific they're trying to bring back? So I was like, who died? Uh, like, the former empress died, like, canonically, like, not even a year ago, I think. Like is that is that something? I don't know. I have no evidence. Um, but then my other thing is, are they trying to create like perfect vessels to um, put the triad in to to bring them back? That is definitely kind of where I'm hitting. And like, I don't know how much I believe that the. Because there are th there are three of them. It's a triad. It's the mother and her two children, a son and a daughter. I don't know how much I believe that like two of them are already gods. Because I would have like sh more shit would have had to have happened. It kind of be like oh, like hundreds of years ago, two of the three became gods, and they've just kind of been vibing ever since, right? Like mm -hmm. you got two thirds of your way there. That's enough to enact whatever plan you had as gods. But I. I do think they alluded to the fact, like Jisman said, that they didn't fully lose or that they won in some regard. Whether that's them just being like, well, we weren't actually all killed, we scattered our whole consciousness, and from there we can rebuild. Because um, I do agree that they're trying to build better bodies to get these souls of the like original triad in uh, the triarchy into the uh, new bodies. But I'm just wondering if it's just the daughter or if it's all three of them mm -hmm. and if it is just the daughter what happened to the other two um so like there was the mind body soul like each of the people were mm -hmm. it was lagazi gary and nira and gothbrook mirror Goth. gothbrook um like do each of them have something to bring one of them back like is the eye gonna bring one of them back and then like Lagazi has something of another one to bring that one back and oh. then does Gothbrook have something to bring the third one back so you're thinking in we'll skip forward a little bit here a little bit of a spoiler Hazel was tasked in putting one this eye in the, it's an eye right it's like it's own mm -hmm. eye mm -hmm. yeah. yeah in the back of V5 I believe is what we're calling him uh, V5's mm -hmm. head. Um, do you think that would in some way like that is the consciousness of one of the triarchy that would then be put in the body? If if I may interject here, now that we're talking about that, I think the whole point of making the perfect body might be for all all of the consciousness to be directed into one body. That one super body? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. And it would also make sense as to why Clay made a very specific note at the beginning of the campaign that ages are not as drastic as traditional D&D. It would make a lot of sense for everyone to be like, hey, let's try and live as long as possible in this perfect body. And I do think it's kind of a very godlike kind of situation to have multiple consciousnesses in one perfect body. So now that Nick has put that out there, I think I think that might be canon. Another thing is... Uh, the daughter in the book alluded to the fact that she has like a physical she's physically trapped mm -hmm. it's not her soul in the book the book is just like a portal and like a, like a means of communication with whoever holds it 
she's like, I'm physically trapped somewhere in the city. I need you to find me. Mm -hmm. That also may, that might be just like a Horcrux situation. She may believe she's trapped, but it's actually an artifact that's trapped somewhere. Like the eye, for instance. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Well, I guess that's kind of like the question I wanted to pose. Do we think like her physically being trapped is a Horcrux where like her consciousness is somewhere trapped? That could be unlocked. Or do we think she's like physically in a jail somewhere? I, I think she's Horcruxed. Because yeah, if she's as powerful she as she thinks, then even with magical means, I think she'd be able to get out some way. I don't know. The uh, that's a pretty cool. I don't know. <laughs> And kind of bouncing off of that. So she said they were partially successful. I wonder if them, if like the kingdom interrupting the ritual, like, and this is going with kind of a post apocalyptic theory. What if them interrupting the ritual of them ascending, or them, maybe they're like, bodies weren't refined enough to handle the uh, ascension destroyed the rest of the world and so that's why they're hiding it because after the apocalypse uh, this city was the last one remaining I could see I could see that <laughs> Because the only part of recorded history that happened outside of Melanova was like the Ascendancy Triad stuff. With the mm -hmm. original 30 Knights of the Emerald Order going out there to like stop them and whatnot. Um, and the original thwarting of the Ascendancy Triad. So it would make sense that while they were out there, shit went sideways. Big boom. Mm -hmm. Everyone came back to Melanova, put up some magic and acted like nothing happened. Um, any more thoughts about the conspiracy before we move on? Has anyone had a chance to speak? Oh, quiet, you haven't had a chance. I don't have anything to add, that's why I'm sp spoken. Um, sweet. With well, that being said, moving on to the next, uh, question. I go back to, uh, Petra. Once Hazel and Draven had done all they could, they handed the reins over to Petra, who began to brutalize the creator. After the adrenaline of the moment had worn off, had she come to regret her actions, or did she manage to achieve a semblance of closure? Um, if she ever comes to a point of regretting her actions, it will be some time from now. Um, she's still in her grief deeply. Um, and it won't be until she starts to leave that grief that she, um, will be at a point where she can start to be like, maybe I overdid it. I don't think she'll ever regret killing him. No. But um, maybe she'll regret killing him four times. Um, but I, I, I think that's all there is. I, I, I don't think she'll regret it. All right, fair enough. Um, next question. During the walk back to Petra's, Moon and Hazel had a conversation regarding what had just happened. Um, did the conversation change Moon's opinion of Hazel, and why does Moon think Hazel went to him above anyone else? Man, what was that conversation about? Uh... <laughs> if I recall, basically Hazel was just like, I didn't like that. Did it change his opinion of her? Not really. I think it just solidified what he thinks, because he's always kind of just been like, honestly... At, like like I said, as soon as he found out that she was just like 17 years old, it just totally reframed the way that he saw Hazel. And this just like reaffirms it more so, which is also why when his mom was like, you know, like, oh, does Hazel know? And um, being like, you shouldn't trust her and all this stuff that Moon was like on her defense more was partly because they did have that conversation. Um, because it reaffirmed the way he thought about her. Um, and yeah, it was a, it was a nice conversation, you know, he didn't feel like he was actually the, all that helpful, really. Um, 
and he like he did have more to say, but Hazel kind of like scurried off relatively quickly, awkwardly, more awkward than him actually. Um, and yeah, he's just kind of like made a mental note to keep maybe an eye on her and maybe like check in later on um, about some of the stuff because. Yeah, he feels like maybe... He doesn't think people in the party put that much pressure on her, but he thinks that people in the party don't treat her like a kid very often. Um, like with Hazel, like, kind of taking point on the torture. Like, everyone just, like, let her do that. But he was like, why would you let a 17-year-old just do that? And he knows he's not any more innocent because he also just let people, like that happen but you know um with that conversation yeah he's like i think you there's this idea that hazel has it together and is like mature and strong and like um can handle these things but you shouldn't make like just because she can doesn't mean she should right um so he wants to probably check in with her later um and maybe help her feel more like a kid because he's starting to get the feeling that she isn't never had that i guess especially if she's wondering like i should like i should be comfortable with that i should be fine with that that means someone's told her that she should be fine with that that's been instilled in her that she should think those things yeah the emerald order made torture seems so cool you know, it wasn't. Mm, I want to give spoilers so bad that I will refrain. I have that same sigil that Gary had on his tongue. Oh. <laughs> um, wonderful. Uh, next up, Petra seemed to truly believe that her son was still alive somewhere in the amalgamation of flesh. She treated the golem as if nothing had happened and even began babying him to a degree. Does Petra truly believe that that is her son? If so, do you think they'll ever wear off? And if so, uh, what will she do then? It feels so popular today. I gotta do torture more often. This is a, um, a very <laughs> intricate episode. Uh, like, on a surface level, she has the mask that he's alive. This is her son. She can fix him uh me uh but but uh but like deep down she understands the situation she's just not ready to face the situation um there will be a time definitely when she uh, is just like yeah he's dead where do we go from here um because even if there is one one hundredth of him there, uh, which I think is being generous, uh, it's not him, and it won't ever be him. The other pieces of him, who the fuck knows where they are? Even when we had every piece, we can't bring him back. You know, I, I don't think canonically any of our characters would know of a of anybody who could pull that off um but uh you know I, I i think within the next session or two we'll see her uh have her come to a jesus moment uh and accept what's happened and start taking the steps of moving forward very well um we're kind of uh rapid fire into these questions next up uh giovanni stepped up and attempted to bring petra out of her self-induced isolation by offering to cook uh Vicarus's favorite meal given giovanni has known the group for such a small period of time what made him feel the need to step up and shoulder that responsibility uh 
uh, nobody else was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, so Giovanni kind of knew that Petra is like suffering and he knew it was like kind of a futile attempt but like the time that Giovanni has spent with Petra he's kind of uh, like she's always been there for anybody who's like needed it she's gone out of her way to help them and uh, like Giovanni genuinely, genuinely believes like Petra is ju like fully as nice as you can as you can be in her situation. Um, she's like he was he was an orphan too. Like these, he he really resonates with like what she's does for the party and does for her like family members and if he he felt like he needed to offer support even if he didn't think it was going to be taken just to to kind of reach a hand out um if there was a way to pull her from you know any bit of grief it's worth trying. It was his mentality in that, and that mindset. Um, he he put the offer out there too, as kind of an extension for whenever she feels comfortable. Like the he wanted to offer it early, so you know when it, whenever she wanted to, she could go to him and and kind of heal by by getting her mind off of the situation and doing something else that had a happy memory uh embedded in you know the sadness that she feels so that that was his kind of mindset for the uh, interaction he figured she would turn it down but he wanted to open that up for the future yeah it kind of segwayed off the back of that um Petra, given the fact that you ultimately did turn it down, did, I guess, kind of like either consciously or subconsciously, Petra recognize that as like a kind gesture from Giovanni, despite ultimately not accepting it? Or would you think she was just so tunnel vision she just shut it out? Now, you know, Petra may have taken it as an insult. You know, <laughs> someone else cooking? She she's lucky she didn't kill Gio. Giovanni's lucky she didn't kill him when he made those fucking spaghetti and meatball <laughs> mason jars. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think I think she understood what he was trying to do, um, and that's why she said just like oh uh, another time, um, because I I think. Um, she wanted she, she didn't want to just blow him off or anything like that mm -hmm. uh because again she understood um yeah i don't think i have much else to say on that all right um i go back to giovanni given the fact that giovanni is still relatively new to the campaign and hasn't had much of a chance to characterize himself yet are you looking for more opportunities to do so, and do you see any of those mo moments happening in the future? Characterize uh, is a poor choice of words, because I feel like Giovanni is full of character. But, like, those <laughs> big, defining moments to really, like, center yourself in the campaign. Yeah, and, uh, like, obviously, like, joining, it, like, into a campaign uh, a after it started, like, there's all... there's kind of uh you know I'm, I'm looking for opportunities but you know like i i definitely feel like uh there will be moments when giovanni 
uh, kind of gets the more of the limelight. Um, I, you know, I kind of uh, look for situations where, like, Giovanni would be more fam familiar with as to, like, that way I'm not, like, just completely breaking, like, character, because, like, obviously I know stuff about the campaign, and, like, I've been following it uh, semi-loosely beforehand. Um, so I'm, I'm mainly looking for, like, areas that Giovanni would kind of have either like direct correlation like he can relate with it or like you know instances where he can interject in you know like the uh with bear or stuff like that to help characterize him but yeah i'm definitely like i i i know giovanni time will come mm -hmm. and so i'm not like trying to force myself into scenarios that I don't think would be right for him but yeah I'm definitely I'm definitely looking for ways to show who Giovanni is um, during you know moments and times when I, I think he would have something to say or stuff like that like the like the rose scene where he kind of he was trying to talk down uh <laughs> talk down the situation like that's something he would definitely do like he would mm -hmm. he he sees like everybody's stressed out he he's he knows this family he's you know shared meals with them they're distressed he can understand that and he wants to like de-stress the situation so he'll go in he'll, he'll talk he'll try to de-escalate it uh but yeah so uh for sure giovanni is like he I, he has so much character to to show and i'm excited for him to be able to show it uh because i gave him such like a boisterous personality um but yeah i i'm definitely waiting for like his time oh absolutely and i look forward to it uh, just as much no 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 here's a question what is giovanni actually like is he gonna make moves on Moon Sister? That's the greatest question <laughs> of the century, I think. One of my Would favorite you... moments in the session was just out of pocket. Like Moon's mom has just had this conversation with Moon. You know, I'm a werewolf. I think my sister's dead. She's on the brink, and then out of nowhere, she's like, "So, what do you think of my daughter?" <laughs> uh, the funniest part about that was at the beginning. I I missed. I didn't realize who she was talking about. I thought she was talking about the werewolf that we cured because I didn't remember her name. For the first, like, couple of words that I said, and then I was like, oh no, that's <laughs> that's that's a moon sister. That's the older sister. And I realized that, and I was like, well, I've already committed. To, I, like I said, she was a good girl. <laughs> No, and you so, ended it with saying she was a good girl. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I had already said like, oh yeah, like I like her, um, and so I was like, well, it's canon now. Like, <laughs> this the the Giovanni Rose angle is getting played out. I don't know how it's gonna end, but <laughs> it's gonna end. I, I'm committed to the bit now. <laughs> I also toyed with the idea when Ash inevitably confronts Draven where he panics and he's just like, uh, uh, I'm dating your mom. Mom? <laughs> She's moves. married. Like, hey. happily just, married. Oh, just, just, because, just because there's a goalie doesn't mean you can't score. <laughs> <laughs> how, how happy can it be if he's in jail? You know, oh, she, she has needs that Draven can, pro that can <laughs> Draven meet. If Draven, <laughs> if Draven's yeah. Draven has said multiple times, I can't say no to Ash. It would break her heart. But I could say I'm fucking her mom because that's what <laughs> hurt her feelings before. 
I feel like it's such like such an extreme. It's like where you know something so ridiculous happens that you're just like, okay, that's not real. But something more ridiculous happens, and it has to be real. It's like that kind of spectrum, where it's just like, if I traumatize her so much, it won't register as trauma. If it Draven said that Draven. and he found out, if Moon found out about it, <laughs> dude, Dr Moon would fucking fold Draven over his fucking knee. <laughs> I, Draven would discover what it's like to be fucked by a bear, okay? Oh no. <laughs> I was going to that, that session. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, <laughs> evil comments to be made on this. No, unrelated. Will, GC Man, are you going to try to make moves on Moon's sister? That's. What's the play now? Or do you think Giovanni uh, understood the question? Or did he, I don't, did he? I don't think Giovanni understood the question. That's why he said that she was a good girl. <laughs> he 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 said it because he was like, he thought, oh yeah, like she's nice. She's you know every she's been very generous. Like every time I've been over there, she's you know asked how I was doing. Yeah, she's like a good person. Um, that's, that's how I was like, oh yeah, like, Giovanni completely misread the question. <laughs> so funny. Cause like, him and Bear are best friends. And do you think if like, it gets proposed, right? Like, his mom brings it up, or if Rose like, comes up to him, do you think you as a player will pursue that, or what? Or you just want to see how the cards lie, or I, I'm, I'm. We'll see where the cards fall. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't plan. I don't plan my interactions. <laughs> we know. No, Atta we can boy, tell. GC man, <laughs> Atta boy. Um. Damn, I have something else, but I forgot. <laughs> I mean, what's the ultimate show of bro shit than to date your bro's sister? That's like, that's one step past, you know, the metaphysical bro. I could, I could 100% see Giovanni, like, clasping, like, like, shaking, uh, Bear's hand and be like, we're brothers now. Mm -hmm. Like, we're really brothers now. And then be like, like, chest bumping. You be like, yeah. mainly for Giovanni and uh, Bea. It's... I, I was gonna say that's the real strategy. You you marry your bro's uh, sister, then you become bros, and then you start kissing. And then that's the <laughs> ultimate power move. Crazy. I, By I the way, were, you guys bro. keep calling him Bear. It's Barrel. Just <laughs> Bear. Your friend. Your actual. <laughs> your actual <laughs> friend who's a player. <laughs> he is a bear. He is a bear. So, but it's, it's barrel. Yeah, bear is short for barrel. Uh huh. <laughs> it's yeah, B A R R. <laughs> so funny. All right. Um, moving on. Uh, I haven't written this down, but I do kind of want to touch on this. Um. During uh, the end of the session, uh, Draven took time um, out of the evening to hand deliver the meals to three different people, that being Petra, the werewolf, and uh, the Emerald Knight outside. Um, in kind of a similar vein to uh, Giovanni talking to Petra, what made Draven feel like that was necessary in kind of like taking time out of his own evening to do that? It, it's actually really funny because um, DC Man touched on Giovanni, you know, stepping up to ask Petra if she was okay and like making an effort to, you know, do something. And I feel like Draven has experienced a level of trauma in his own life to where he understands the need to be alone. But that if somebody, if you need somebody to talk to, they're there on, on call ready whenever you are. So him specifically Petra and even so Omara in some sense, uh, which he's kind of already been doing with her to, to begin with is that they may or may not be ready to talk about their problems, but him just being a presence 
and being like, I'm here for you. Just hit me up whenever you're ready. That's that's his way of just being like, they've got to figure it out. And if they want help, they'll ask for it. If not, then I can't force them to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> and the Emerald Knight Lady, Amari? I, for, I, I always oh, forget her name. Chris. Amari. Amori. Amori, there you go. It's almost worse than the Vikram fucking Vikros Vulnerum thing. Yeah. One of them's called like Amori, and the other's called what? Like Omara. Omara. Ruthless. Ruthless. Yes. And, and you know, it's kind of funny because it, you know, before we actually got to know uh, Nick, I wrote Nix as a uh, character. And once we started, I was like, fuck, that's going to get confusing. <laughs> and surprisingly, it hasn't come up at all. <laughs> But uh, no, he 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 offered her food kind of I mean, she's she, obviously she's been through trauma as well uh, here as of recent times. But I feel like Draven's not as in the know about that because Hazel hasn't really talked about it in great depth. Honestly, he just knows about it on the surface level. So at the same time, it was kind of like an extension of friendship. But then she had to make it awkward. Oh, so awkward. And in honestly, Draven Draven's a handyman. He can fix a lot of situation. He can't fix an awkward situation though. <laughs> it's it's kind of as a matter of fact, there were two other awkward situations that that evening that uh, he was unable to stop, which was the slap uh, heard around the world and uh, Moon belting out that he was a werewolf, and he's just like, I can't fix this. Yeah, That's tensions so were high in the sewers today. <laughs> There are no more comments to be made. Uh, move on to the last question. Um, speaking of uh, the werewolf outburst, uh, Moon had a conversation with his mother this session, which ended with Moon coming clean about a lot of things, including his lycanthropy and the fact he believes his sister's son to be dead. What caused this outburst, and do you care to speak to Moon's relationship with his mother? Um, so... Mm. I don't want to phrase this. Um, <coughs> I just choked on that thing. Hold on, let me cook. <laughs> gulp, 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 gulp. Disgusting. Um, so Moon, his relationship with his mom. One thing about his relationship with his mom that, <coughs> you know, is one of those... It's it's a it's a, a lack of something, right? Moon hasn't has only had I think like two on screen interactions with his mother, like conversations. No, three. I think it might be three because including the one that just happened, it'd be three interactions. Um, and with Moon's mom, it's more so the fact that they that that's his mom and they've had three interactions. Um, that I think, like, lends itself to why Moon is the way he is. Like, obviously, he suffered trauma or whatever and had shit go on in his life. But when you look at, like, the family around him and how he's treated, it kind of, like, is indicative of why he is the way he is. Um, and... There was the interaction, bef like, way last time, where he told his mom that there are werewolves in Vista Heights, right? He, like, he was like, Sarah got, I need Sarah to get checked because I think she's been bitten by a werewolf. I made, like, a saving throw to see if Moon would be honest with his mom at that time. And I think I rolled a natural 20. So Moon honestly told his mom there are werewolves in Vista Heights, right? And his mom was like, I think you're confused, right? Treated him like, no, honey, there isn't werewolves in Vista Heights, right? Um, and this time, uh, you know, a lot of shit had happened. The torture shit and whatever. He's like a balloon ready to pop full of stress because there's... Being a shifter has, like, they have extreme reactions to emotions. They're like on the extreme scale when they feel something and he's not used to that and then also 
the lycanthropy on top of that makes it much worse. It exemplifies that even more so. Um, so he was just super stressed out. Um, and when he realized that the flesh golem, you know, like, that could be like, Vicaros, or like one fifth of fucking Vicaros. Um, he's like, that could have happened to my sister too. Like, she's, that's in some category, that's what's happening to these dead bot or to these dead bodies, to the people who go missing. Like, my sister's probably dead. So it's like, we tortured a person, my sister's probably fucking dead. There's all this other shit. Like, I'm a werewolf. There are werewolves in Vista Heights, the Emerald Knights. Like, it's like all of this crap that's been happening is just like bubbling up. So his, uh, you know, mom's talking to Giovanni. Giovanni's smoothing it over, which would have worked. But then his mom, I think like watching the VOD, turned it to Moon and was like, you know, just tell me like, what have, what have you been up to? Like, what have, what have you, been, what were you doing? Right? She outright asked him like what they were up to, which was torture, by the way, torture and murder was what they were doing. Uh, and they killed someone who was a fucking murderer, psychopath, fucking Leatherface. Um, so she, like, turned that question on him, and then, yeah, he just, like, popped, right? Uh, and was like, I think my sister is dead, just outright. Because it, one thing, too, is, like, the, his family had never talked about Sun being missing, really. It was just rumors, and, like, people noticed she's not showing up, and no one really asked Moon why like it's just like oh she's missing and like it's a conversation that never happened and his mom's just kind of like holding out hope that she's somewhere out there and Moon too in a way was holding out hope you know he runs into these strangers the start of the campaign um people are like oh the other people are going missing and they've been investigating it and now it's reached a point where they're in some deep shit um and it looks like she's probably dead. Or, like, honestly, something worse might be happening to her where it's better to think that she might be dead. And his mom's, like, finally, like, what were you doing, right? Like, kind of, like, comes to grounds. What were you doing? And he's just like, I don't want my mom to live with this delusion that son's just out there missing, you know? Like, she's probably fucking dead. So he's just out. But he doesn't say it eloquently. He just shouts out, I think she's dead, right? And then his mom breaks down um, and, you know, they have a little bit of conversation. She's still trying to be, like, comfort Moon and is comforting Moon more than she ever has, which is not much. And he also lays on top of that, like, uh, yeah, I'm a werewolf, right? And again, you know, it's almost like he thinks to himself, you should be able to tell your parents something and feel safe and feel comforted, right? You should be able to, like, say something to your parent and they... Blanket of warmth, right? Like, it's okay. In the same way he wants to do that to Hazel, like, Hazel's, like, you're 17 years old, you shouldn't have to be go through those things. You should be able to have, like, an adult who's like, you're just a child, I can shoulder this burden. You don't need to go through that. So Moon's having this, like, explosion of, here's this shit going on. I think my sister's dead. I'm a fucking werewolf. All this stuff. And he doesn't feel relieved. Like, he's saying this to his mother, and he does not feel that, like, relief from it. It's no comfort. It's nothing. Um, and, you know, the conversation ends off with, like, uh, his mom brings up Hazel, which moon defends hazel in that moment being like she's just a kid because of the conversation they had earlier which turns his mom on him to saying like you know what why don't you keep doing and looking after yourself like you always do and i'm gonna go take care of our family in a sense like once again like pushing moon away which really solidifies like kind of their relationship um and their dynamic which has gone mostly unspoken but moon's on the outs of the family always kind of like has been and everyone in the family his family has always said like oh, we have no problem with moon we love moon and all this stuff but this is truly at the core how his family treats him <laughs> yeesh <laughs> nah um 
Uh, beautifully put. Um, that is the last question I have written. Anyone have any questions they would like to pose to the group? No? Okay, Hazel. Miss Samantha. You want to talk a little bit about your uh, your little done deal? Your little bargain? No. We're good. There's nothing really to touch on. <laughs> are, you, are you no. sure about that? <laughs> um. Listen, I think ironically it wasn't going nothing was going to happen i i because i wanted hazel to be like hazel's smart you know what i mean she's not very wise but she is smart and boy if you know anything about magic like hazel does crazy necromantic fucking tomb that whispers dark secrets to you that's evil fucking 10 out of 10 times that's evil so i kind of wanted her to be in a position where she was like, I'm not going to be an idiot. This is obviously evil. You know, I'll keep it for safekeeping, but I'm not going to give into it as much. And then we had the torture scene, and we we got more questions than answers. We would give information, but it kind of blew the proportion of what was happening out of the water. It made Hazel feel really small. Um... Also, how meta do I want to get with this? Because I've spoken to it. I mean, this I is the this is the meta conversation, isn't it? This is the after show. This is where we get meta. Okay, so there was a on there was like the in character assessment of like Hazel felt so small in that moment. She had no idea she was in over her head. She's always wanted magic, but like wanting magic in that moment wasn't enough. Feeling powerless like she was was enough to drive her over the edge and at least open up that conversation had um and that's when she's like i'll talk to you later yada yada, yada. um out of game i thought to myself we're due for a leveler hazel at level three will get magic there needs to be an in-game reason for her to acquire that magic Otherwise, it would make no sense. Her character would make no sense if just randomly we hit level 3 and uh, Clay was like, we've killed enough rats in the sewers, I guess you get magic now, even though her whole character arc was struggling with that. So I'm like, we're about due for a level up. In a very metagame, I was like, this is Clay's way of functionally giving me magic with the confines of the story so that it makes sense that we level up and then... I'll be able to have magic. I didn't think of that at the time, which is why Hazel just fucking popped into the book and didn't, like, engage with it at all. It only happened after I sat with it and at the end of the session I was like, this is probably the best way. Lo and behold, as soon as I interact with the book, we all get a level up. Um, so I was kind of correct. That's the super meta reason Hazel kind of engaged with it, alongside the in-character reason. Um, the whole, like, Oh, if you do this favor for me, you'll get your magic you deserve. If you do another favor, you'll get a bit more. That was Hazel being like, fuck it, I'm already fucking this deep. Why not go balls to the walls with this? <laughs> why, why not go four deeper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's that's kind of, that was my thought process towards that. Plus also, I'm a messy little bitch. I love... I don't know why it's always me, or if there's like, play knows that I'm the most likely to do it, because it happened at, um, what was it, a couple campaigns ago, Chaotic Average, where there was a cursed crown that I got, and now it's a cursed book, and I just think it's very fun to sow conflict within the party. <laughs> so you get a couple levels of Warlock, do a couple evil necromancy things, it's only good fun. Okay, you know, when I sow conflict in the party, I just kiss another player. When Sam sows conflict in the party, she wants to put a fucking eyeball into someone's dead son. Yeah, but when you word it like that, you... When Sam wants to do it, she becomes a warlock with a fucking lich. <laughs> okay. 
I didn't know I was going to become a warlock. Thank you very much. <laughs> you didn't think you were going to... When she said, let's make a deal, you didn't think you were going to become a warlock? No, I don't get that warlock brand that she's seen that. You oh, found an like, evil, evil crazy. fucking I... <laughs> book that has an entity, a powerful entity sealed inside of it that said, let's make a deal? What a thought in my mind was about like i'm this is a warlock this is a warlock like arrangement i'll probably get a level none of that went through my mind i was just like this is a crazy book this is as gonna soon be as magic. that happened i was like warlock <laughs> that's, okay. that's that's a patron right there you're talking to a patron right now i'm not keeping these warlock levels long i'll be lucky if i get one fight in before hazel goes against the fucking book and then bro you cannot go against the clay book. clay immediately <laughs> after last session was like do these favors you're like okay teehee Just literally a few days later nah i ain't <laughs> doing it it's not real just like that your power of me isn't real <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna you're not gonna do a, fl- a favor and you're gonna lose like six levels even though we're not level six <laughs> hazel's gonna, gonna turn into negative. voldemort from the end of fucking deathly hollows <laughs> too <laughs> yeah how do how does everyone feel about sam being uh fucking like two levels higher than us fucked up uh, we we as a group have to uh fight hazel uh That's true. if we if we all jump her at the same time we might have a chance yeah, we, we have to show dominant as, as a <laughs> You as a will have a chance, absolutely. Because to what Clay said is like, I was like, hey, can I like swap out intelligence for charisma to make this a bit more of a viable? He's like, no, it's not meant to make you that stronger. Honestly, the most beneficial thing is that I get two levels worth of HP, right? Yeah. Like I get an extra mm-hmm. 2DA. That's my biggest thing. And my at level five, my um proficiency bonus is increased. But like outside of that like a fucking i can't use any good spells because my t- like save dc and my to hit are like dog shit so like none of her spells are that particularly good invocations are interesting but i want to keep those a secret from the party from what i've picked but they're not that great either um and like warlock doesn't mesh with fighter very well at least unless you're explained but like yeah undying is the one i had to pick i can get spare the dying cantrip very cool. Um, and it ah, yes, v- very cool. It's almost like we would have had a feather in on the on the back burner if we had that earlier. Mm. Mm. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, spare the dying would have helped. Pitcher got wallet. Pitcher got one shot. She was dead. I know. I, I, I know. I'm fucking with you. No. Also, you make it sound like you wanted me to make this horrendous evil deal sooner. Yeah, you, why didn't you do it sooner? Do it in session three, it would have been so much better. Why didn't you summon the tentacles into the Rosen Complex? I mean, yeah, that being said, that's all I have to say. My, to me, it's not even a defense. <laughs> I fucking, it's a dumb, stupid move, but it's a dumb, stupid move I think a teenager would make, and uh, I rest my case. I do like it, though. <laughs> Yeah. I am curious how much this is going to fuck with with your character, though. Like, in terms of, like, builds. Because you, you mentioned that you're not going to keep them long. I think you might keep them. And it might you might just be fucked out of the max level that you're going to get. If his thing, two is a... If, if I do have to keep them, two is a very intentional number. Mm-hmm. Because 18 is the last... Like, even if we... I Because I don't think Clay's intending us to get to level Ten is to get to oh. level ten. But like, if we get to level ten, that like having two extra levels won't matter because mm-hmm. like if we if the intention was always to get for us to level ten, Hazel would just be to level twelve, and she would have leveled normally either way. Mm-hmm. God, if we're getting level ten, if we're barely level three. You think it's too big? <laughs> you only would have brought up level ten. I thought that's what you said. I said level twenty. Oh. All, that, that is that is assuming that you will continue to gain levels with us, though. But do you think I'm just going to be on a completely different, like, fucking wavelength? 
No, I'm thinking that we will get two more levels, but you will stay the same, and then we'll start leveling up equally. No, Possibly. I, I don't know. Clay loves unbalanced stuff. The Clay loves inequality. Let it be known right now. <laughs> <laughs> we know this to be true. Session. What a note to end on. Close us out. Yeah, no, no, no <laughs> I got I got one more. I got one more. Um, Draven said he had to go make a collection. Uh, how many oh, yeah. people actually believe him? Uh, zero. And I assume none of us. Did he did. say that in the War Table yep. Council? Yep, he intentionally said that he had to go make a collection. Oh, no, Moon believes him. Speak for you. He, tr <laughs> <laughs> he has no reason not to believe him. I he think Petra's the only one that didn't hear. Yeah. Yeah, I think Hazel believes him too, because Hazel doesn't know much about like gang shit. And like, is it Hazel? Like, I think if you would have said something so far removed from the Shadow Snakes, she wouldn't have believed you. But the fact that it's like the best kind of the best way to get away with a lie is to sprinkle some truth in there. You mm -hmm. are doing something for the Shadow Snakes. I, like, I intentionally said a collection that way I didn't have to make a deception roll because I'm not lying. I am gonna go make a collection. It's just not what you expect. No, T -he. That's a that's a deception. I don't know why Clay would have rolled it, but as your DM, that would have been a deception too. If you nah. were actively leaving out information, that's that is yeah. Also it'd still a... be deception, but it seemed like it would just seem like you were withholding information. Yeah, yeah rather than actively lying. Yeah, but yeah. that yeah. being said, like you said, it's 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 a better lie if you sprinkle some truth in there. Yeah. So like, if you would have just been like, I need to go make a delivery with the local grocery market, Hazel would have been like, why? That doesn't sound true. But you were like, I need to go do something for the Shadow Snake. So she was like, that's already like something what you would hesitate to admit. So she didn't look too much deeper. Mm -hmm. And I did and I did it in this way. That way I'm like, I don't want to involve you guys in gang related activity. I'm I'm scot free. I'm gonna go get curb stomped by an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> I do really like the idea of like Hazel waking up the next morning and like looking more powerful somehow. And Jim's like, "You free tonight, by the way?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, what, what, Giov what made Giovanni not believe was when Giovanni was like, "Oh, like, do you, do you want any help or anything?" And that's when Draven got like real dodgy. <laughs> Instead of just saying, no, it's okay, Draven was like, oh, no. God, that's no. You don't have to worry about it at all. <laughs> uh, I might have misremembered but... that scene. <laughs> no, he definitely was. Draven was like, no, 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 no. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I mean, I. I may have over exaggerated a little bit but, but no that, that that was kind of the intention as well because mm -hmm. i i like to sprinkle in just enough to be like somebody yeah. be like hey what's up you're like nothing <laughs> i didn't do anything <laughs> who me but no i mentioned this to Kawhi that um after our last session and i've mentioned it in the last after show too that i was worried whether or not the loxodon is a leveled uh person or not uh because yeah one-on-one -on -one D, D combat typically doesn't go well you know regardless um but that being said um especially because clay admitted that omara is going to be a mpc when she's traveling with us that leads me to believe that the loxodon will also just be mpc and it will be a more mental battle than an actual battle battle. Yeah, it'll be a bit more roleplay than, like, actual combat. Mm -hmm. And if it is actual combat, level 3, I have more damage options now. True. So, I'm not as worried. Hmm. Key point. Disengage. Action dash. Um, <laughs> fuck that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I am absolutely looking forward to the Loxodon confrontation, uh, regardless of how it plays out. I think it'll be fun. I really want it to be just like, you see this old ass Loxodon. He's barely walking, and I'm like, all right. Yeah, the clay's going to be like, he has a layer action. Um, 
<laughs> Legendary resistance. Loxodons do have high constitution, so my poison stuff won't be that good, I guess. Hmm. Oh, we'll see. Alright, if there's nothing else to be said, I think this is where we're going to end this session. Alright, thank you everyone for watching. Uh, if you're watching this on Twitch or on YouTube, uh, love yourself, love each other, love animals, stay hydrated, and uh, we'll see you back 7 p.m. Uh, fucking, I'm not used to American time zones, California time on Saturdays for episode 14 of <laughs> Bellanova. See you. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>